I'm going to just start off with a short 90 second uh, video just to give you a feel of uh, Intrepid. I said that I would write you In the mornings of the day We said many things It's easy like sun Okay, so that's, that video was made by two food bloggers, bloggers uh, Daniel and Mira from America, and they travelled around the world on, uh, with us uh, to make blogs about food. Uh, we, have a, we have a range of food tri uh, trips and, uh, and they made about 30 short videos uh, about the aspects of food in various countries around the world. Intrepid Travel, what do we do? We, travel in small groups with an average of about 10 people. So it's very much group travel all around the world. We take people to 120 different countries in the world and we travel using local public transport as much as possible, staying in small hotels and guest houses and trying to really experience a country as it exists, warts and all. It's because too much tourism is really shielding people from the reality of what people's lives are about and we want people to really interact with local people, learn about their customs, learn about their religion, learn about their food, learn about their history, and come back with a deeper respect of what that country is all about. Intrepid has been going for 25 years now, which to me is just mind-boggling. Um, it's still my new little company really, but it's not new and it's not little um, because we carry 70,000 people each year. Uh, but 25 years ago, or 27 years ago, just to give you a bit of idea of how it started, I, I hadn't worked in the travel industry and neither had my business partner, Daryl. We were both backpackers. And in 1987, I went backpacking around Southeast Asia. And I was living on 10 to $15 a day, as you could at that time. And I couldn't understand why any sort of organised tourism cost at least $100 a day. If I can live off 15, we're in developing countries, why does organised tourism cost 100? And that was just in my mind. And also while I was travelling, I had this idea of, well, it's great backpacking, but there must be a lot of people who would like to do backpacking, but perhaps aren't confident enough to do it for themselves. What do they do? Do they just have to go and stay in Hilton hotels or in resorts at Phuket? What do they do? And, uh, and that was just buzzing around in my brain. During that trip also, I, uh, I went with a friend to China. And for our first week in China, we did a tour. We did a cycling tour and it was really good fun. We didn't do terribly much cycling, but it was really nice. But we stayed in, uh, in really good hotels and we had banquets every meal, banquets in special tourist restaurants. And that started me thinking, well, surely someone could offer a style of travel that 
wasn't so luxurious. It didn't actually give you so much, but could be offer you much better value. So that was just ticking around in my head. Incidentally, a year, the following year, I was with a group of people who went traveling across Africa in this truck, and the actual slide's back the front, but if you look at it carefully, you can see it's registered in Victoria. And there's lots of companies, that, especially back in the uh, 80s, that did uh, trips like this in trucks across Africa. But we didn't do that. We bought this truck off the Ngunnawading City Council. It was a tip truck. And we put it on an orchard out at Wonga Park and we spent six months stripping it down, putting in a new motor, putting in long range fuel tanks, water tanks and building it up so you could store six months of gear, seats and uh, everything you needed. And we put it on a Polish ship and we sent it, sent it to London. And we had 14 people, nothing to do with Intrepid, it was a cooperative. These people all put in a couple of thousand dollars to make it happen and we drove that, tr that truck down through Africa for six months. And that's a whole topic in itself. I can talk to you for hours about that. But it was while we were traveling in through Africa um, that I have a truck driver's license and I'd be driving for many, many hours through the Sahara Desert and my business partner, Daryl, would be sitting next to me and he was newly married, so his wife would be there. And we'd talk about this concept of taking people traveling in a different way than what was available in the market and how, gee, it'd be really good uh, not to keep, b keep busy, people busy for um, hours and hours of, for, you know, eight hours a day. How'd be great to give people the flexibility to have some organized activities, but then have some free time as well. And we'd talk about how um, you don't want to be moving on every day, how, you know, you want the pace of the trip to be a holiday and not be, uh, not be a, you know, not be like work. And, uh, and then we'd forget about it for a couple more weeks, then we might talk about it a bit more. So, um, and what we were actually doing was creating uh, the unique selling points of Intrepid. Not that we knew that phrase, it probably didn't even exist at that time. So, travelled through Africa, uh, six months finished up in Kenya, and uh, Daryl and his went, wife went off travelling, and I went to Turkey. And a few months later, we met back in, in Melbourne. And Daryl is a fairly impatient person. He'd already been back in Australia for a month. And the day we got, I got back, he calls me and says, Jeff, we've got to talk about it. And we sat down and decided, well, we're, we're back in Australia. We could go off and uh, start applying for jobs or we could start a, a company in the travel industry. Uh, we don't know anything about the travel industry, um, but that's what we decided we would do. I should be moving my slides on a bit quicker. Um, I won't talk about gorillas, but could. Um, and just, <laughs> just a, a slide of um, where we went across Africa. So with no experience of the travel industry, we decided to uh, start a company. And we very quickly decided that we wanted to take people to Thailand because both of us had traveled there and we felt like it offered uh, what people uh, need to do in, uh, while they're traveling. It just offers everything you need. And Unbeknown to us, the way the travel industry works is that a company like ours, it's a tour operator, they don't actually run any tours. They would have a company in Thailand that runs their tours for them. We didn't know that. We had no idea. We wanted to take people travelling with us. So uh, Daryl was married. He's soon going to be having children. So he stayed in Australia and did the sales and marketing. And I had the, the better job of going over and leading our, our trips in Thailand. And, uh, and that went quite well. Um, very small groups for, at first, but it gradually built up and we started employing other leaders and started new destinations over the next year or two. Our second destination was Borneo. And then we started taking people to Indonesia and, and just gradually spread out through, uh, uh, through Southeast Asia. In 1993, we uh, were one of the very first companies to take uh, people to Vietnam. And that just caused a huge explosion in our business. And we kept growing, it kept expanding into China, India, and before long we saw ourselves as a very much a Southeast Asian, uh, as an Asian tour operator. And, uh, and things were going along quite well. But then not everything goes to plan. And while the 1990s were pretty good time, the 2000s were actually the pits because we started off with the 9-11 bombing, then we had Bali bombing, then we had SARS and other bombings in India, bird flu. And these things all a huge setbacks to the company. And we realized, okay, Asia's not enough to make ourselves as a, a secure company. We've got to be operating into other parts of the world. So rather than adding a, a new country each year, we started adding a continent each year and still until we were uh, offering a product worldwide. <laughs> um, so, um, 
So SARS and bird flu particularly knocked us about and, um, and at that time really uh, something happened that really uh, exemplified what Intrepid was about and um, we, uh, during SARS, we knew that um, our business dropped away quite dramatically and we should have been putting staff off. Um, but we didn't want to do that because we'd had enough experience to know that after each of these major setbacks, business soon gets back to normal. And so we didn't want to put people off and then have to uh, employ more people uh, and retrain them. So we asked our staff, staff to take a, a salary cut and 70% of our, our staff volunteered to take a 10% pay cut and our senior people took a 20% pay cut. No, no promises about what would happen uh, or anything else like that. Uh, just the slide, rest of the slides are just for you to enjoy while I'm talking. Um, <laughs> And we did that and, and three months later, business was getting back on its feet and we replaced everyone's, uh, put everyone back on their normal salary. And then a few months after that, we were doing quite well as a company. So we, we paid everyone all their salary, but not only that, we paid, repaid them uh, a bonus on top of them as thanks for, for them having that, their faith in, in what we were doing. And, uh, and we've done that now twice as a company and it's, um, it's really helped to build the culture of what Intrepid is about. These setbacks also didn't stop us from doing some of the other things that we uh, really value as a company. And one of those things that is very much about giving back to the communities where we work. And before we even were profitable as a company, we were supporting small, small projects uh, in Asia. And we did that and gradually built up uh, to the stage where we were donating 10% uh, of, uh, of our profits each year to development causes. But that was great, but we also had passengers wanting to give, us, uh, give money to these causes. And so in 2002, we created the Intrepid Foundation, and that enabled us to receive money from our travellers to give back to uh, all sorts of organisations uh, then around the world. And we began matching that dollar for dollar. So every time someone uh, donated a dollar, Intrepid would match that, so that we were able to say, go out and say, because people are always concerned about where their money goes, we were able to say Intrepid pays all the costs of the foundation. Not only does 100% of your money get to where you want to donate it, in fact, 200% of that uh, goes to, to that organisation. Intrepid also has a, a very strong philosophy about what we call responsible travel. And responsible travel is all about um, ensuring that the, the uh, places you're visiting are going to be uh, visited in a sustainable manner so that you can visit them for a long, long time in the future because our industry has too much history of damaging the places you want to visit. So we want to ensure that um, the, the locals very much benefit from us visiting. We want to ensure that our travellers um, dress appropriately for the places they visit, that they behave appropriately for the places they visit. And we were very much one of the uh, companies at the forefront worldwide in that and, and Intrepid has uh, received numerous worldwide awards for, for its uh, work in responsible travel. In uh, about 2007-2008 the whole uh, global warming issue started becoming uh, quite an issue and we, uh, we really identified that uh, we were central to that and while we're not an airline um, people need to travel by air to, to uh, undertake our trips and that we need to be, we decided that we needed to be part of the solution, not just part of the issue. And so we went about a three year study to make our trips uh, uh, carbon neutral. And that was an incredibly difficult thing to do, to work out a bus in India that you use for, 100, uh, for a 100 kilometre trip, how much carbon does that put out? And a, a truck that we might use in Kenya, how much carbon does that put out? And so it's a very, very difficult thing to do, but we managed to do that over three years and make our trips carbon neutral, and we're probably the first company in the world to do that. And it's not that it's an opt-in or you pay extra or anything like that, it's just part of the trip. The trip is carbon neutral, you can buy it and it's the way it is no matter what. And, uh, and that's been a fantastic achievement for us. And one of the things we really tried to do is make that, it was a big project, but make that uh, a normal part of our business. And as it was winding up and becoming a normal part of the business, we thought, well, what are we going to do next? What's another big project that we can take on? And 
Working in developing countries, we're very well aware, which I'm sure many of you are, of the issue of how important it is for girls to get educated for the development of, uh, of a community. So we created a, a project called Project Sama, and the word Sama is a Bahasa word which means equality. It's a project to really uh, raise funds and raise awareness of the importance of girls to get education. And so we've been working for the last few years really to um, to internally to the company and externally to really help make people understand how uh, for every time a girl gets an extra year's education, I think she has um, you know 0.5 less babies. She's going to more, earn more income, uh, and that income is going to be used for the benefit of the family. And uh, and that's a, a, a fantastic thing that we've been doing. And there's a, a film out uh, recently which uh, really exemplifies that called I Am a Girl, which we uh, helped uh, help uh, get going. People often uh, ask me, well, Jeff, do you still get time to travel? And, uh, and I do. I, I say, no, not much, but I probably do three or four trips overseas. Um, and one of my recent trips was to Egypt. And I, I had never had a great desire to go to Egypt, but um, my family wanted to go. And I was just blown away by Egypt, by the, the welcoming nature of the, of the Egyptian people. And I have this saying now, which I, I like to tell people, and I think that really every American teenager should be sent to Egypt just to learn how wonderful Islamic people are. And the world would be such a better place if, um, if all American teenagers got to uh, experience Egypt or Turkey or you know, one of those countries. Um, and my next trip, uh, which I'm looking forward to, we're 25 years old this year, our PR people are trying to organise for me to take a group of press to Iran. Which, uh, which is, you know, I am just so much looking forward to doing. So I do get to, to still do some pretty amazing things. And sometimes look back and, or people ask me, well, why has Intrepid been successful? And I think a, a couple of very big reasons behind that. And one is that we've always had a real purpose. And uh, our purpose is to give travellers the best uh, travel experience ever. And it means that our people are really focused on that and know what we are doing. And the other really important part of what we do is our culture. And really culture is such a core thing for a business that, um, that uh, it's just for us um, such an intense and important part of our, of our development. For the future, um, I'm very confident about our future. Um, there's all sorts of things that we can be doing. But what I'm less confident about is the future of business overall. Um, because in a lot of ways, um, business now has a very bad name. And we just see examples time and time again of companies uh, behaving in an inappropriate manner. And in recent times, I've become involved in an organisation called Conscious Capitalism. And Conscious capitalism is about the idea that business is really important and capitalism is really important. But capitalism in a lot of ways has lost its way. And the idea of conscious capitalism is that a business should have, in fact there's four core uh, tenets as we call them of conscious capitalism. And uh, business should ha all businesses should have a purpose beyond making profit. And for someone like me who started a business, I didn't start a business to make profit. I started a business to provide a service and making a profit is a result. Businesses should uh, be very much stakeholder oriented. They should be thinking about what is a win-win situation for all the stakeholders. It doesn't have to be me winning, someone else losing. Uh, everyone can benefit from, from a business. Leadership is a very important part of this as well. Um, leadership is uh, a very important responsibility because leaders have a very, very big impact on people's lives. And conscious uh, capitalism talks about um, leading from behind and gone are the days of the hairy-chested leader, you know, demanding that people do this and do that and behave uh, in a certain way. There's no need for that anymore. And, uh, and leaders can be uh, really expressing love uh, for, their, for their people, all their stakeholders, to, uh, to help them to uh, all contribute to uh, the benefit of an organisation. And finally, culture. As I said earlier, culture for us has uh, been extremely important. 
uh, culture it, for a business is in fact more important than strategy and we put a huge amount of effort into developing the culture, ensuring that our uh, culture is uh, appropriate to our business and that we're um, that our people want to be there, that they want to be engaged and we're fortunately, fortunate to be working in a, an industry where um, people uh, want to be there, they want to be with us and, uh, and that they do stay engaged. So um, just wrap up, um, I guess to say that uh, business for me, I've had a quite amazing journey and going forward um, I want to, I'm going to be working in conscious capitalism to really promote the idea of um, businesses being responsible. Thanks.